So today we begin the, uh, the really substantial part of the class. Last week we were talking about the conceptual background for this course and what is a social good, uh, what uh, is this idea of the commons, and uh, how has the, the worry about depleting the commons affected our thinking about uh, shared resources, privatization, uh, and um, really the conditions through which we react to changes uh, in the world on a global scale uh, that affect us all as individuals. And um, we did that in a fairly abstract way. We talked about philosophy. We talked about economics. We talked on a conceptual level. This week, we're moving into the, the heart of the matter uh, in one of the most uh, difficult areas, really, uh, uh, for thinking about social change, and that is uh, poverty. Uh, and the relationship of poverty to philanthropy and to foreign aid, um, uh, how do we mitigate the effects of poverty? And even as I say that, I realize that um, for some people that's not going to be enough. They, they really talk about eradicating extreme poverty and the possibilities for doing that. And I'm going to show you some of the clips from the Social Good Summit, uh, especially a short clip from the president of the World Bank, uh, Jim Kim, uh, about the progress we've made already – in eradicating poverty, um, uh, reducing the level of extreme poverty, and then uh, we will talk about the, the, the work yet to be done and, and, and whether one should be hopeful about that uh, or not. Uh, we're also going to talk about um, some of the critics of the, of the, the of foreign aid, of, 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 of you know, the, the, the critics who, who question whether the changes we've had in regard to extreme poverty, the reduction of extreme poverty, have uh, those, whether those changes can be uh, attributed to aid, to social uh, uh, action through, through foreign aid or not. Uh, and we'll talk about um, um, some of the major uh, theorists or, or, or economists working in this area um, uh, who will uh, help us understand um, what's at stake in thinking about what we can do in regard to extreme poverty. Finally, we'll talk about um, a, a new uh, approach to this subject through um, randomized uh, experimentation uh, or randomized controlled trials uh, that uh, takes the big picture, certainly uh, in mind, but tries to uh, uh, attack uh, the big problem of extreme poverty, capital E, capital P, tries to attack that problem by uh, small step-by-step -step measures that you um, are, are testing along the way to make sure that what you're doing actually has a positive effect on the problem you're trying to solve. Now, as we start this, I feel I should say once again that uh, your, your teacher in this course on Coursera, your professor in this class, uh, is no expert in the area. And... Uh, for some of you, you'll say, well, gee, I'll turn this off right now or go on to some other class at, at Coursera or elsewhere. Uh, uh, but I hope you won't. I hope you'll, you'll stick with this because uh, the, the, the experiment we're doing in this class is that your professor, uh, Michael Roth, uh, is all learning along with you. Is that, you know, I will be talking with some of the, the great experts and have been talking with some of the great experts in this field, and I will try to introduce uh, us all to, these, uh, to the work in the field. Um, uh, as I learn along with you. So I will be having conversations with uh, academics and activists, uh, and, and some of which we'll record and put on uh, um, line for the class, because I am learning along with you. And at Wesleyan, we have this tradition for a long time. We, we started in the 1950s having programs where some of the professors, uh, uh, team teaching in that case, the, some of those professors were always non-experts. Because we have felt at Wesleyan for a long time that one of the most important things you, you do when you're teaching in the university is model learning. You're not just professing. You're not just giving out information. You, you can get information just by doing searches online. What we're trying to do is to show uh, our students here on campus how we learn with them and the excitement of learning together and hope that that excitement is uh, is productively contagious, if I could put it that way. So here we go, um, uh, talking about this week uh, uh, extreme poverty, what we can do about it, big challenges, small experiments, and, and um, whether radical change is, is still possible. 
So I, I should say from the outset that the, um, uh, extre- the, I, the problem of extreme poverty is, is very closely tied to the, to the problem or the fact of inequality. Now, uh, uh, because uh, extreme poverty becomes much more glaring to uh, those who are not living in it when they are further away from the condition of poverty. In other words, as inequality grows, as it has over the last couple of hundred years and in an extreme way in the, in the last decades, as inequality gr- grows, the persistence of extreme poverty uh, becomes more obviously morally reprehensible, um, uh, economically uh, 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 poisonous, uh, and socially uh, unacceptable, uh, politically unacceptable. And so inequality in the, in the last decades in the industrialized world um, has, has, has grown uh, precipitously. I, I can say just about in the United States, um, uh, there has already been a, a, a move against this, right? If you've, many of you uh, watching will have heard about Occupy Wall Street and other Occupy movements uh, uh, that are, are really grow out of uh, the outrage of the accumulation of wealth by a very small fraction of the population while um, um, even more great numbers, greater numbers of people fall into poverty. Um, the inequality is growing in the developed world uh, uh, in, in a significant way in recent decades. Uh, what we also see is that the inequality between the developed world and the uh, developing world uh, has also uh, uh, become a, a more obvious uh, 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 more obviously persistent uh, a problem that we that we um, uh, uh, in the developed world and in the developing world are trying to address. Uh, these are cycles of deprivation that we are dealing with here. Um, we're not. We, there, there, there is um, the shock of finding people living in conditions that are morally reprehensible, that are just depriving people of the of a, a chance at a, at a decent life, and that's very important. But we also have to note that the, the persistence of poverty uh, is, the, uh, is, is the cutting off of potential in the world, that there are millions of people who are dying too young, who have no access to education, who live stunted lives because of uh, 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 disease and... and, and uh, 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 and a, a lack of access to uh, to basic uh, uh, material conditions that, that that they're living lives that all of us can see as lives of deprivation, lives that continue a cycle of a, a lack of development. I guess what I'm trying to communicate here is that it's that the condition of poverty is bad enough, but we also have to recognize, as Amartya Sen said some years ago now, that the that the, the persistence of poverty is also the robbing of human potential. And poverty is not just a lack of money. It is not having the capability to realize one's full potential as a human being. So that even when life goes on, we must recognize the cutting off of potential um, that uh, is a result of living in poverty. That lives um, that are not fully lived means fewer contributions to economic development, future, f- f- fewer contributions to culture, fewer contributions to science. Um, and uh, uh, poverty deprives us all of those contributions. It's contagious in that sense, right? Just It's contagious because we don't, we don't have the benefit of a life fully lived, nor does the person whose life is, 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 is filled with suffering because of that poverty. Extreme poverty is our, is our focus this week. And I, I think that... Um, uh, uh, it's important for us to see uh, uh, that extreme poverty is persistent, although there, there have been important uh, uh, points of progress in, in the last uh, decades uh, in reducing the numbers of people who live in a, a extreme uh, a po- a poverty. Unemployment, hopelessness, little economic growth, these are some of the characteristics of the uh, regions where there is extreme poverty. What is extreme poverty? The definition used by the World Bank and by many other uh, organizations is living on less than $1.25 a day. Okay, $1.25 U.S. dollars uh, a day is the, is the uh, conventional 
definition of um, uh, extreme poverty and what we'll use in this class. And let me just give you some figures on uh, the scale of this problem. 21%, 21% of the world's population is extremely poor. 21% of the world's population. Now, as you, as you know, that, that is not distributed equally across the globe. 75% of the world's extremely poor live in South Asia or Africa. Three quarters of the world's extremely poor live in South Asia or Africa. About three quarters of, of, uh, of the poor live in rural areas. And I, I think that's important to note. Um, we often have images of poverty uh, in uh, big cities and sh- surely, uh, especially in the developing world, many urban centers become magnets for people who are trying to escape poverty, and poverty can persist uh, in the, in the uh, uh, areas just around urban centers. But three-quarters of the poor live in rural areas, and that means uh, it's important to know that their very important problems are sanitation, clean enough water, access to decent transportation, and access to markets. We'll come back to this again and again this, this uh, week. Access to markets in general, or the creation of markets in general, is an important topic for us. We have to not just see uh, poverty as a lack of uh, wealth or a lack of money. It's it's a lack of access to markets for uh, for many of our economists because without access to markets, you don't have access to economic development. You may have access to food when somebody gives you a bowl of rice. You may have access uh, even to fertilizer if somebody gives you that. But what's really important for moving out of poverty in a sustained way is not just access to stuff that reduces your suffering, but access to mechanisms that will allow for economic growth. That's the important thing that we have to underscore uh, uh, throughout throughout our discussions of, of poverty this week. Well, we're here today with uh, Mike Nelson, who teaches in the government uh, department here. He's a specialist in uh, African economic development and teaches courses uh, dealing with politics and economics, especially in the developing world. And uh, uh, Professor Nelson, very good to have you here today. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for, for inviting me. Thanks for being part of this conversation. Uh, as you know, this course is, is called How to Change the World, and what we're trying to do is uh, understand some of the key global challenges uh, facing people all over the world. The students in this class, um, which will number in the uh, tens of thousands, as we record this, there are around almost 30,000 people signed up already, and uh, more will probably sign up in the coming uh, weeks. Uh, uh, those, most of the students in this class will be living outside of the U.S., um, uh, and uh, many of them have uh, concerns about uh, extreme poverty, um, about economic development, and how to uh, address what, for a long time, people thought was an intractable issue. But uh, my sense is, from um, uh, reading the literature, that there's uh, different reasons why people are hopeful about uh, sure. dealing with extreme poverty. Uh, and maybe you can um, help get us started by saying a little bit about the landscape of work in this area. What, what do we, when, you're, when you teach a group of beginning students here at Westland, what are some of the things you really want them to know about poverty uh, as we start off? The issue of poverty is, of course, a global issue. And uh, while it often is referred to in the context of developing countries, one of the, the, the messages that I think is useful for people to recognize is that the, the landscape is much more diverse than that. Mm-hmm. Um, most uh, of the poor live actually in middle-income countries increasingly, uh, and we're seeing that partly because of good things that are happening in the world. Right. A lot of countries that used to be lower-income countries are improving their status, their, uh, their, their economies are growing, and so they're moving into the kind of the middle-income uh, area. But if you look at the top three countries where uh, the, the, the poorest of the poor live, it's going to be China, India, and Nigeria, um, three very populous countries. Right. And so if we think about how we're, we're, we're crafting solutions or, 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 or approaching the, the challenges associated with extreme poverty, that's one thing to recognize as well. And, uh, and in those countries and in much of the developing world, 
it is more of an endemic problem. It is more of a, of a permanent problem for, for the people that experience it. We, we have our own versions yes. of extreme poverty here in the United States, which I'm sure you were aware of as well. Um, you know, if you were to look at what, where we set the poverty line, just right. to kind of contextualize this, we set it at around $17 um, dollars per day per person. Um, if we were to look at how the U.S. Census Bureau defines it, it's, it's more along the lines of about $8.50 per day per person uh-huh. is deep poverty. Right. Um, and then uh, some researchers out of Michigan took a look at um, what where poverty levels were in the United States, and they found that, well, if we look at $2 per day per person in the United States, uh-huh. um, it's really closer to uh, 1.5 million households or as many as 3.5 million children in the United States in any given month might be having that kind of experience. Right. Um, and for them, of course, it's not as structural. They might right. be moving through this as a transitional phase, whereas for many of the populations that you know, we're going to be talking about today, um, it's definitely more of a permanent experience uh, and, uh, and something that um, uh, it requires maybe different approaches. And I think the, I mean, one of the traditional pictures of poverty is that it, it's, uh, it, it, it's rural. Um, it's uh, in places where there is very little access to either transportation or technology. And I guess what you're reminding us today is there's some truth to that, but there are also, uh, especially in, in developing countries and in, in developed countries like the United States, uh, poverty can be found in very different kinds of places. Yeah, and, and urbanization is happening very quickly across Africa, the continent I know best, for right. instance. And a lot of the new urban are urban poor. Um, and, yeah. uh, and, and they're living uh, at, at these very low um, subsistence um, levels. So, so um, what... What um, claim do, does the existence of a significant number of uh, people living uh, in poverty or with the threat of extreme poverty, what, what claim does it have on people who don't go through that uh, experience? I mean, why, what, 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 why should we be paying attention to this? When I approach this subject with my students, um, I often like to talk about it in um, the context of, of different worldviews that people often do have. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, so, so there's a worldview out there that tells us that Boundaries should not matter, whether they're political boundaries, mm-hmm. um, whether they are uh, boundaries related to um, religion or family, even for some philosophers and thinkers on these issues, um, that those boundaries don't set uh, our moral obligations and where our, where our moral obligations and moral responsibilities lie. Um, and so what is happening or occurring in the life of someone on the other side of the world that we've never actually met, Mm -hmm. um, we may have some responsibility for Mm -hmm. um, in the same way that we have responsibility or may feel that we have responsibility to people that are in our more local communities and families. and, and that's something that I think it's, it's very abstract. It's very right. difficult for people yeah. to connect to. But that, that kind of a view, which uh, Charles Bites, who did work on this back in the, in the 70s and 80s, um, uh, t- calls a kind of a cosmopolitan right. um, worldview, um, is one, though, that I think animates much of the discourse on development and aid and how we approach and think about um, the, uh, our obligations to, to handling the situation of extreme poverty. You know, there, there, there are other perspectives and worldviews of, too. Um, you know, we could go to the opposite extreme, which is to say that our moral responsibilities lie primarily within our own communities, right. and we have to recognize that there is a moral imperative there, and one that's easier to connect to socially, culturally, in, in many respects. Um, it's one of the reasons why we're more likely in America to give money to uh, to, to to research on cancer right. than we might be to preventive measures dealing with malaria. Yeah, that's great, great um, and example, if you know, yeah. if you're thinking about, you know, where could we have the most impact with our own giving as individuals, um, it might be that latter scenario. But it's hard to make that that connection. Yeah, it's so interesting you uh, you raise that uh, in that framework because. Yes, yesterday, as we're taping this, yesterday was Giving Tuesday, you know, um, yeah. this organized event through the uh, 92nd Street Y and the UN Foundation and other partners uh, that are part of this class that uh, uh, we're, we're putting together. And I, I saw with in my own family, you know, what was attractive to my daughter as I asked her to go online and find... Um, uh, organizations that she felt were worthy and that to see if there's some outside validation that they were organized well and the money would be used well. And um, 
uh, it was it was a, a really interesting experience as she you know is attracted to little kids you know and she's attracted to, of course, like many people to individual stories so when we say um, uh, that one billion people live in extreme poverty you know that's that's disturbing and shocking but it is rather abstract as because it's such a big incident of the number but when she sees uh, as she did yesterday we we're looking at heifer uh, the organization didn't they, you, you can yeah. buy, buy animals for a village or for a person you know she found a, a, a child and it was able she said I, I want to give money so this this family uh, can get a, some 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 chicks because the chickens will produce eggs which and et cetera et cetera and then you start a virtuous circle um, and I, I, it is interesting how the internet can actually make um, the other side of the world seem quite close and yeah. for some like my daughter's a teenager she's used to actually connecting to people who uh, strongly who are not um, just in the neighborhood. No, absolutely. And and I think we're seeing that those connections are continuing to develop. I mean, yeah. larger numbers of Americans, it seems, are having experiences abroad, and that's yeah. also leading to uh, different kinds of connections and feelings of, uh, and perhaps expanding our, our range of thinking about um, the populations to whom we feel morally responsible to. How did you get interested in Africa? Uh, to, as a, as sorry, how did your work start there? Yeah, no, for me it was partly accident. Um, I was... Uh, Finishing up my undergraduate uh, education at UC San Diego and uh, was trying to think about what I was interested in. I knew I was interested in international politics, but I also knew that I never really lived in any other part of the world. Right. And so I uh, applied to be a Peace Corps volunteer. Uh -huh. And uh, and so uh, I thought they would send me to Latin America or East Asia. I had been taking Mandarin and Spanish uh -huh. in college. And uh, they offered me... Uh, an opportunity to go to Ghana, uh -huh. and uh, that brought me to Ghana, mm -hmm. and it really opened my eyes to a whole range of different things, including the fact that, well, there is some associationship between wealth and happiness. Mm -hmm. I experienced a village where there was no wealth, but there was actually quite a bit of happiness. Uh -huh. That was nice to see, but it also was frustrating to see the, yeah. the kinds of challenges that these really wonderful, friendly people were facing on a daily basis, um, challenges that we don't even think about. Give me some examples. What kind of challenges are they facing? One of the tasks that was set uh, for me was um, working on water and sanitation development. Right. And so we formed this water and sanitation committee. And just the process of trying to come collectively together as a village to save for projects, for future projects, so that they could contribute collectively to a well or mm -hmm. to latrines, that kind of thing, right. was a big challenge um, because it required that they take on personal responsibility for choices right. that um, are, are not easy choices when they're thinking about, well, do I put this money here this month yeah. or do I use it for something else? Right. You know, and, and Duflo and Banerjee talk about a they similar do, thing in yeah. their book. Yeah. You know, but I, I definitely saw it in my own experience um, where just that process of kind of saving for those um, those things that would really improve their lives yeah. in the long run um, was was a, was, a, was a big challenge. Education was another area where the incentives aren't aligned to bring good teachers right. into these villages. And I've seen some improvement. I've gone back. I was just back um, actually uh, um, uh, this last summer. And uh, there, there are very big improvements that have happened in that village, both in terms of water provision and in terms of economic development in general. But it's it, it's been a hard, slow road for them, uh, and and that's the other thing I've noticed. Yeah.